Good morning. Class is reassembled for the first time face to face in about two and a half years. Um, it's amazing that gap just there, isn't it, in our collective past? It feels very odd, I have to say, for those of you who have been involved and participated in our webinars, not to be sat in my little office at home with a decent clean shirt, my oldest jeans below the <laughs> desk, and complete mayhem outside that very neat field of view when I sit down and I need to move this and I need to move that. Um, so thanks ever so much for coming. It's great. It's great to be here. Two major achievements on my part before we start this morning. I consumed two fried eggs at breakfast and none of it is on my shirt or tie, which, believe me, is a huge achievement. And the second achievement is getting up that step without going flat on my face. So... We're, uh, we're off to a good start. Um, before we start, I just wanted to read you a tweet, which it was the first one I read this morning. Bear with me while I find it. Here we go. Six railway stations shelled in centre and west of Ukraine. No casualties among railway people and our passengers. 14 passenger trains delayed. 14 after six stations were shelled. First already started moving again, the rest will move within two hours. Infrastructure is significantly damaged, more details later. I mean, what an incredible job um, railway men and women are doing in Ukraine. And although we have got some very severe problems we need to handle, uh, we're not being shelled to, to that degree. So I just had to share that with you. So today's conference, we all know the big issues, GBR, Electrification, fares, tickets, the white paper, the new railway, commuting, leisure. LNER leading the pack on 90% of people back on their trains with a full timetable. That sounds like a big achievement, and it is, but it still leaves 10%, which is a big number, and other talks are lagging significantly behind, leading to a £2 billion funding gap. Now, as regular readers of Rail will know, I am no admirer of Shaps at all. Um, but Anthony Smith has just pointed out that he has kept the investment going, so fair enough, that, that is true. But that £2 billion funding gap cannot go on forever, and some of the uh, issues surrounding that will doubtless come up this morning. The Treasury is desperate to cut that, um, which raises that spectre of managing the railway by cut cost rather than revenues and growth. Um, and that's something which the industry really does need to, um, to address. Very different kind of service, more leisure, less commuting, it requires different things from the, from the rail industry. Um, we must grow revenues and reach it the industry's brain for a new kind of post-pandemic approach that is much less about commuting and more about the leisure market, and which requires a very different approach. Of course, commuting was fading long before the pandemic. We'd all seen the Friday being the new Saturday. Um, that platform which was burning is now ashes and we do need a new railway. Family fr friendly travel is going to be a big thing and I'm not sure that the industry has really cottoned on to that. Um, small things may be but symptomatic of, of, of big issues surrounding the approach. Reconfiguring train interiors. William said in his report we should do that. He also said we need the DFT more out of micromanaging the railway. I see little sign of that at the moment. Somebody was telling me the other day that Avanti has now got 29 civil servants monitoring that one operation. 29. Scary, isn't it? So there's plenty for us to talk about. Um, great to get together, I said, face to face in a, a room full of people with about, I think, 50 or 60 joining us virtually. Um, and for that, we'll have virtual questions coming in. Will you please give a big welcome to my co-presenter, co-chairman for the day, Mr. Paul BBC Clifton. I'm quite to say that it's Paul Clifton, BBC transport correspondent, BBC, just in case. He's not paying well, attention. He's underlining. Yeah, there you go. So Paul's going to be um, assisting with general chairing duties. Um, if I give him a nod, he can take over because I'm sure I'll run out of steam at some point and he can do a much better job than I will. Um, we have not printed the agenda as a handout. You can download it. There's various QR codes about the place 
and it's on the boards around the, the room. We decided to save a bit of paper and not do that. And none of it could have happened at all without our sponsors, to whom I give my heartfelt thanks. Um, the headline sponsors, RDG, RSSB and Trainline. So thanks to them for uh, bring, wheeling out the big guns. And our co-sponsors, Alstom, HS1, Independent Rail Retailers, IRR, LNER, Sistra and the West Coast Partnership. So thanks to all of them for, uh, for helping make today possible. So let us get on with it. Some of those things which I talked about will come up. Uh, maybe some won't, but I have a suspicion that many will. Um, so to kick things off, we'll, get, well, tell you what, we'll get all our speakers up here first, shall we, Paul? And then you're not sitting there in splendid isolation. Um, sadly, Peter Hendy isn't with us, so he will be joining us in a moment for a, um, for a, a video presentation. Um, otherwise, the other speakers are. Your speakers, we're going to get them all up here now. Should we get the speakers up here? Would everyone who's speaking in the first session like to come and join us, please? Alex. So, would you like to introduce him, Paul, or shall I? Uh, you start, well... I we, started with Hendy. You start, you start, you start with Peter Hendy. Um, but then we'll, we'll work our way through these gentlemen. We have time for questions and answers afterwards. So the way this is going to work is Nigel will look after people in the room. I will take questions that come through from people watching virtually. Good morning to all of you. Um, if you'd like to put questions in during the morning, please send them through. I'll look at them on an iPad and interrupt Nigel when there's something interesting to ask. Um, but the format is each of our speakers is going to do a little session first. We will then take questions for everybody afterwards. So up here we have Anit Chandarana, who's a lead director for GBR Transition Team. We've got Neil Robertson, the chief executive of ENSAR, who's very good at throwing hand grenades into a discussion, and I'm looking forward to Neil doing just that during the morning. Um, and we've got John Davis, the Vice President of Inder Industry Relations for Trainline. So let us start, get underway, with a video presentation from Sir Peter Hendy, CBE, Chairman Network Rail. So roll VT. Hi, I'm Peter Hendy, I'm the Chair of Network Rail. And um, it seems slightly ironic that on the first time that we are really able to have a conference where everybody's there in person after two and a bit years of COVID that actually um, I can't be there. Uh, so here I am at home as I've been on and off for many, many months speaking to people uh, remotely. But never mind all that. Actually, there are loads of uh, good live speakers today. And um, uh, the relief for you is that this is only a short introduction from me. Um, we are on the cusp of great opportunities for the railways after some very, very difficult circumstances. Um, the good news is that the government uh, are, are paid for the railway to carry on to serve essential, uh, essential workers and, and freight during the pandemic and in comparison to other industries like if you speak to anybody from the coach industry or the airline industry they've been ravaged by covid and we haven't that's the good news the government recognizes the importance of rail for the economy uh, of this country the more the more difficult news is that our finances are now in disarray the treasury shelled out 18 million plus on the railway during covid and it doesn't fancy paying much more than uh, it, it's done uh, and it also is seeing that the revenue is 70% of uh, costs, which are down nearly 100%. So that is a challenge, that's a real challenge, but there is an opportunity. And the opportunity is, is GBR. The opportunity has been created out of the wreckage of the timetable crisis of May 2018 and the embarrassment that we did at Network Rail and train companies did in various parts of England at the timetable change that went wrong and inconvenienced a lot of people. The then Secretary of State Commissioner Keith Williams to make a fundamental review of how the railway was structured and in particular how it should best, best address the needs of its customers. And Keith has done 
a fantastic job. Not a fantastic job, that sounds like fantasy. A brilliant job at actually analysing what customers and of the railway said they needed and then devising an organisational solution to, uh, to make the railway uh, work better. So out of uh, the support we've got through COVID, the current financial challenge and the government's determination to enact the William Shapps review in legislation and create Great British Railways, we've got a great opportunity. Um, it is a, a challenge, we'll have to change, but actually as I keep on saying to many people, the railways has, has in fact evolved constantly throughout its nearly 200 year life, and even in the recent past it's evolved. Who thought 25 years ago that passenger traffic would double and the railway could cope with it? Who thought 40 years ago that freight would be back but in a different form than it had been for the 130 years before the 1960s? And we can make that change if we work together. And the message is, my message is, we've all got to work together because we've got to, uh, we've got to make the economics of the railway better. We've got to live within the, uh, the funding that government uh, is willing to give us to run a decent service, both for passengers and freight. Um, and we've got to get the customers back uh, where we can to the extent to which they'll come. And we've got to move forward. All of which I think is very capable of being done. Um, the GBR is a seminal moment. I, 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 uh, some of you will have heard me say, when I ran Transport for London, I would have died for that organisation in the sense that it was the right creation to serve London and, 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 the, and Greater London with, with, with transport services of all sorts. It was a natural thing to create and it worked quite well. It was a mixed economy, as some of you will know. Some of the services we ran ourselves, some were contracted, some were regulated, some one or two of them were commercial. But that was the right thing. I don't feel like that with Network Rail. Network Rail is a recent creation of a, of a fragmented industry, as Keith remarks. I will feel like that about GBR, providing we do it properly, because once again, we're going to be able to present <coughs> the railway as one network addressed to the customers, the passengers and freight customers um, that we've got, and capable of responding to what they need to do in the third decade of the 21st century. And look no further than information, fares uh, and, and, and ticketing. Not just fares and ticketing reform, but starting from how you think you might do your journey. Where do you go for information? How easily can you pay? Do you trust the system? Can you buy it with a card online like everything else you do now after COVID? And the answer is we have a long way to go. And Keith's recommendation is that we take the opportunity of the post-COVID environment in which the train companies can't realistically take revenue risk. We transform the whole culture of how we deal with customers. We get people to trust us with their money as we did at TfL. We, get, we give their money back when they got it wrong without hassle, just like Marks and Spencers and John Lewis. And people start to trust us again. And, and, and a word on, on train line with that, I, I've, I've certainly been quoted as saying I don't think the industry should have let train line exist, and I still believe that's true. I think allowing somebody to interpose themselves between the, the, the people producing the services, i.e. the operators, and the public is extraordinary. No retailer would have allowed that. But actually, they're there, and they've done a good job of it, and they are trusted actually more than by the, more than many of the train companies are trusted, sadly, by our customers. So they have a part to play in the future. And we, what we need to do, what we all need to do, wherever we come from, whether it's the private sector or the public sector, whether it's the operating part, the industry, or the infrastructure, or indeed the vast supply industry that depends on us and we depend on them. We've got to work together to make this thing work. One of the things that I'm interested in is that not everybody thinks GBR is necessarily a good idea. But I haven't met anybody for a long time who knows what else to do. We know that the railway is, 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 is complex to run. We know that the contracts don't, don't work in their present form. We know that there's great dissatisfaction. And actually it's up to us all to make this work differently uh, and, 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 and better.
better. And I think, well, I think we can, I think we can, we can, we can do it. Um, I also want to say a little bit about the industry planning process. When I ran TfL, we had a set of strategic objectives set out in the Mayor's Transport, uh, in the in the London Plan, which was an economic and spatial development plan for London. We had a transport strategy that said what needed to be done in transport terms to enact the the economic development plan. We then had a business plan. We prepared projects, and and and, and with with the amount of money we had, we did the best ones. Now the railway isn't in that position, but it could be. And I think that one of the most important things that GBR needs to do is to assemble what the railway thinks the best things to do are to enact the government's uh, um, uh, uh, priorities for the railway. In fact, we, we're, we're quite blessed because government as a whole, not just the department, but other parts of government, the Treasury, has set out the parameters that they want the railway to work for, what they want it to deliver in economic value, in jobs, in housing, in social cohesion and in, uh, uh, in it, and in sustainability terms, in broad sense. And the work that GBR is doing, Elaine Seagriff and others, is to produce a plan which says, well, if that's what you want, here are the projects that we need to do. We'll get them ready enough to know how much they'll cost and how long they'll take to deliver. But then you government actually have the final choice because it's your money. Always remember in this discussion, it's their money. We're not spending our own money, we're spending taxpayers' money and we're spending money at the behest of a government that's elected by people. And therefore, we have to produce what we think is the best thing to do and then we have to debate and do in the end what the government decides. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, 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 I reject the notion that somehow there's too much political interference. I think it's up to us to show that we can run the railway properly. It's up to us to show that we can produce plans for the railway. I think it's up to us to not need a d deep level intervention by politicians when they see things are going wrong. And the result of that is that is that actually we will get the funding to do what we need alongside the other priorities that government has of health and education and now sadly with the Ukraine defence as well. So we'll never get as much as we want, but we can at least hopefully be trusted to do the right things with the money that they want. And and, and I think that's really important. And that is a collective in, endeavour. You know, who would have thought a few years ago that the government would have got slated for the integrated rail plan because it only had 96 billion pounds worth of plans in it. Only? Some of my predecessors would have wept for a tenth of that money and, and actually our job is to spend it. And, it. and it's a great vote of confidence in the railway when the opposition aren't criticising that plan for it being too great and too much money being planned to be spent. They're criticising it because they'd like some more to be spent. So we've got to work hard to do to, to do that. We're collectively responsible. Conferences like this allow us to exchange views and to hear from politicians of all parties and other stakeholders what, what they want. Keith has done an absolutely brilliant job. Keith is a friend of mine. He's a very astute business person. He, he comes to the railway from a private sector background of understanding what customers want. I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with the conclusions that he reached. I'm absolutely right behind GBR. I'm probably a bit old to play too much of a part in it because I'll be 70 next year. But I think this is the best structure that the railway can have. And hopefully what we might even be able to do is to put to bed the debate about whether it's public or private. The railway is largely public. We're, the, <laughs> the, the government owns the infrastructure. Nobody else could take the risk and it pumps a lot of money into it. So actually that's the basis on which we need to go forward. And what I rather hope is that at the end of the transformation into GBR, we can perform well enough to do what we managed to do at TfL, which is that there was no debate about whether TfL should contract things or whether it should do it itself. The debate was about how well it performed and how well it could spend its money. And that's where we need to be in the railway. The very last thing I'll say is that I, I don't suppose in the few days between me making this uh, making this video and the conference there'll be much change to the threat of uh, of industrial action by our trade unions. 
I think it's a real shame. I think I think the country is challenged by the economy, by inflation, by uh, political circumstances, some of which, like the Ukraine, absolutely not of our own making. And I would like to think that whilst our employees deserve a decent uh, a, a, a decent reward. Uh, that, that actually we can at least agree that actually the right thing for the railway is to be productive, is to get the most we can out of the hard work uh, done safely by the people we employ, whoever they are. And I hope that, that the industrial action doesn't happen, If I fear it might, but I hope at the, out, at, 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 at the end of it we can put that behind us and actually run the railway in an economic way to deliver the services which our economy so 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 strongly relies on the railway to deliver. I'll finish as I started. The, rail, the, the connectivity delivers economic growth, it delivers jobs, it delivers housing, it, it delivers social cohesion and it delivers um, a sustainability. That's why governments invest in it. That's a good reason for us to deliver a bloody good railway for the people uh, uh, of this country. Thanks for listening. I hope you have a good conference. Well, there was, there was lots in there, wasn't there? Lots to chew over, from the train line shouldn't exist, <laughs> to some, sorry, train line, um, to some observations about uh, what many people see as inevitable forthcoming industrial action. They're things we'll pick up on during the course of today. It would be lovely to ask some questions to Peter, but he's not here. What we do have instead is an awful lot of the top team of GBR. We've got Anit coming on next, we've got Elaine, we've got Rufus sitting in the corner over there who will be taking questions later in the day. So uh, pile up those questions please. When you do have questions for us, just a plea at this point of the day, yes. please keep them short, short and please don't turn them into a lecture of your point of view followed by a yes or no answer. Um, what I want to do is encourage debate amongst the people here. Um, that's what we're after. So, with no more ado, it is a pleasure to introduce Anit Chandarana. Um, Anit is one of the key players in this new shape of the rail industry. He's Chief of Staff at Network Rail, but also the Lead Director of the Great British Railways Transition Team. Uh, now, you played a big part in drawing up the white paper, the structure of what this railway is going to look like. Uh, Anit's calling his presentation The Creation of GBR. Let's have a listen. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you for the time uh, for allowing me to speak to you. Um, just, uh, Paul, since we last spoke, my role is now just lead director at uh, GBRTT. Even I can cover both the role of chief of staff and uh, uh, lead director. Um, and uh, my successor as chief of staff at Network Rail is, is a lady called Louise Cavanaugh. Um, so I'm going to cover a bit of what we've been working on as GBR transition team, actually what GBR transition team is about, and some early thinking around the structure of GBR. Um, and I'm going to be touching on some of all of that, but as Paul said, quite a few of my colleagues are here later today. So Elaine is here, uh, Suzanne Donnelly is here also, Rufus and Helen McAllister, uh, where they will get into a bit more detail of some of the areas that I touch on. Um, and before I get into the detail of what we've been up to, it is worth just thinking a bit about what the William Shapps covered. And of course, Peter covered uh, a lot of that, but some of it is worth just a bit of repetition. And the bits I'll just touch on was um, when the William Shapps Review was published, um, there were a lot of sensible recommendations and some really good insight into the state of the industry. And the overall um, response to the William Shapps Review was a broad consensus on both those issues and the recommendations. And one of the significant recommendations was the creation of Great British Railways, uh, which was about bringing the railway together again after many decades of fragmentation. It, if we deliver the plan as uh, Keith envisaged and as uh, Grant has put in the plan, this will be the biggest change in the industry in 30 years since the privatisation of the industry. So what is GBR Transition Team? Well, the GBR Transition Team has got two broad roles uh, in delivering between now and when GBR is stood up. One of those is to look at the operating model, to design the operating model and stand up GBR for day one. 
But it's also about bringing the railway industry together in that interim period between now and then to see if we can make uh, and deliver meaningful change sooner. And I'm going to talk about both those aspects as I uh, walk through uh, the speech. But before we get to that, I just want to talk about what we see as our purpose. And some of you have heard of this before, but I think it's worth repeating. We see our purpose as creating a simpler, better railway for everyone in Britain. And by that we mean simpler and better for customers to engage with the industry, simpler and better for our partners, whether that's our public sector partners in the DFT and government, or our private sector partners who will continue to participate in the industry in a large way, whether that's running passenger services, freight services, working with organisations like Trainline, um, the supply chain, and also simply for our people to work in the industry to deliver that outcome for passengers. And all of that is whilst delivering those outcomes for passengers whilst reducing the burden on the public purse. And it's worth thinking about what we mean by the burden on public purse because for too long, and I think um, Nigel referred to this earlier, for too long we have focused on the cost element of the industry without also paying due attention to the revenue element. And that's not to say the cost isn't important, of course it is. But revenue is also where we've got to be thinking. So what are some examples of work we've been doing in bringing the industry together? That, that, that work between now and when GBR stands up. And I will come back to the, the, the GBR. The whole industry strategic plan, a 30-year strategy for rail, which started with, as Peter talked about, last December, the government uh, setting five strategic outcomes for the railways. Just to be clear, that's not just what the DFT believes or what the Secretary of State believes. This was a whole of government pronouncement of what they saw as a long-term strategic outcomes for rail. And those five outcomes were meeting customers' needs, delivering financial sustainability, contributing to the long-term economic growth of the country, levelling up on connectivity, and delivering environmental sustainability. Now, over the winter, we've been out talking to uh, uh, the industry at large. We've met 420 organisations. We've had 30 stakeholder forums. And we've had two supply chain events, as well as ministerial roundtable. We also had the call for evidence for the WISP, which I know many of your organisations will have contributed to. And since that time, we've been analysing what we heard and the written submissions we received to that call for evidence. And in the coming weeks, we are going to be publishing what were the summary of themes that came from that emerging call for evidence. And just a reminder, what those discussions and calls for evidence was about is how do we, as an industry, and also participants in the industry from outside of those directly involved, see the best ways in achieving those outcomes? We were really pleased with the level of quality of submission. There was a good, strong sense of understanding a good strong sense of what those strategic outcomes were and some really good ideas. That's not to say all of those ideas were all congruent and happily facing in the right direction. So we're going to have some difficult decisions as we go forward about how do we get through that. And once we've completed that call for evidence summary, we'll be working towards submitting a draft strategy to government by the end of the year. And of course, those long -term, uh, that long-term strategy is vitally important for us, but we face a very near-term risk, which is around the railways' uh, revenue position. And that's a challenge we've all got to face. Um, as Nigel said, £2 billion shortfall in the industry. That can't be undone by some tinkering at the edges. So we've been working with industry, with government, with other parts of, uh, uh, of uh, sector to think uh, about what are, the, uh, what are the activities we can be taking on now to bring passengers back to the railway. So some examples of those are the book with confidence uh, mechanics, which, which allowed passengers who'd booked advance tickets to make changes. The research shows us that 15% of people who booked tickets advance tickets during that time wouldn't have done so without that guarantee. That's equivalent to two million journeys in that period of time. 
We've also seen the launch of the second phase of our Let's Get Back on Track campaign. Some of you would have seen the TV adverts uh, and, and others. And that has also delivered good recognition amongst passengers, recognising and remembering those campaigns and changing behaviours. More recently, we've worked with RDG DFT to launch the Great British Rail sale, encouraging customers to book tickets um, through a seat sale where, with the promise of a million half-price tickets. So far, the data at the end of nine days of, uh, of activity showed that that brought in a £7.5 million pound incremental uh, position um, with £1.7 million pounds on the first day, which is broadly in line with our expectations. And once we're through the campaign, what we'll be able to understand is how much of that has led to not just point purchases, but also sustained purchases. Now, whilst the industry has recovered, and on average we're seeing week on week somewhere between 75 and 80% of pre-COVID uh, pre passenger levels, the picture beneath that is much more complex. Leisure travel is now broadly in line with what it was pre-COVID. Indeed, in some weeks, it's ahead of, um, it's ahead of what it was pre-COVID. Commuting is about 60%, and that's been pretty consistent for the last few weeks but business travel is right down at 30% of pre-COVID um, volumes. So in the months ahead, we, we got to work together as colleagues to look at how we can further support the revenue recovery of all of those markets. Notwithstanding that leisure is back where it was, there's more to be had there too, as well as getting understanding how commuting passengers' will, uh, behaviour will change and getting business passengers back. And whilst we've got to look at those, um, look at, activities in the here and now on what we can do to bring passengers back. We've also got to understand fares, ticketing and retail reform. Now, it was really pleasing to see the Chancellor in his October statement uh, carve out £360 million to invest in fares, ticketing and retail reform. We know that customers tell us that that is one of their points of lacking trust in the industry. That when they book tickets, they do believe, uh, a large amount of those passengers believe, that they could have got a better price. That's a very different experience to the one that they talk about on the London Underground, where people don't even check their bank statements anymore because they're that sure that they trust the system. So the Secretary of State um, and the DFT have asked uh, GBRTT to lead on that fares, ticketing and retail programme, uh, led by a chap called Stuart Fox Mills. Some of the key deliverables as part of that are how we expand pay-as-you-go journeys, better integration of ticketing, that better information on how we can help customers really understand their whole journeys and how we deliver a simplified fare st structure. That will see us uh, roll out, for example, uh, pay-as-you-go ticketing to 700 more stations than today, 400 stations in the north and approximately 250 additional stations in the southeast. And whilst we're not leading on multimodal policy, we also recognise that's a key area. It was actually a very uh, common thread through the call for evidence, which is about really if you want to think about travel from the customer's point of view, then you've got to be thinking multimodal as well. So as we're developing our fares, ticketing and retail programme, we're also thinking about how that will enable that multimodal uh, opportunities. And we're in discussions with some partners uh, in, in regional authorities who are keen on that as well. And so whilst we're focusing on, on all of those aspects about bringing passengers back, fares ticketing, retail reform, we've also got to think about passengers in other ways. GBRTT has been asked to lead on a national accessibility strategy on behalf of DFT, which is aiming to make the railway more accessible uh, and easier for passengers with disabilities. And it's going to be built from feedback, ideas, priorities from the needs of those people, both from current users and importantly non-users and to understand why they cannot use the railway when they would want to. And if we think about customer insight, um, it's vital that if we want to improve those journeys, we need to understand that customer insight. And we're working with people like RDG, Transport Focus and the DFT to understand how we can do that better to really deliver actionable data to improve every stage of the journey. And we're hoping that that will be up and running this year together uh, with the help uh, of organisations um, like Transport Focus. And when we talk about customers, uh, we must also talk about freight. 
And I believe that we as GBRTT have a key role to play in, in giving that rail freight organisations and both the operators and those organisations that want to use freight a louder voice at the centre of our industry. And as part of that, uh, we're soon uh, starting work on, a, on an additional commission from the DFT, which is to gain information and sector views on how we can develop a range of rail freight growth target options to present to the sector of state. We'll be working with existing industry parties, potential future parties, including operators and organisations that want to use freight. We've seen that during the pandemic, both in terms of the recovery of freight, but also how, um, how rail freight has come back on the agenda for organisations that previously weren't thinking about that. And of course, we understand that part of that is around the sustainable agenda that freight brings. So those are some examples of work that we're getting on with um, prior to the setup of GBR. But a few words on what GBR might look like. Now we're still in the development phase of that and for those of you who will have read the William Shapps review you'll not be uh, surprised to hear that the plans are absolutely about GBR being a highly decentralised organisation. And what might that look like? So if we look at the geographies that, that, the, that GBR will have what we're suggesting is that the, the people who lead those organisations, the, the uh, managing directors of those regions, will be, the, will be the teams that manage passenger service contracts, that carry out the procurement of those, ex, uh, those uh, uh, exercises. They will also be the infrastructure managers for that region. So that there is a very clear understanding of uh, their accountability to deliver better outcomes for customers and to deliver better uh, value for money for those services. If we don't do that, we're not really putting track and train together. Their, their decisions will be around taking trade-offs across the system as a whole. With it, and as I say, with accountability to deliver better outcomes for customers and value for money. And while the plan for rail didn't set out formal further political devolution, we are looking to form more effective collaborative relationships with towns, cities, regions and nations, including formal um, partnerships where those parties want them. And that could include having greater influence over the local uh, stations, for example, services that delivered uh, and, and ticketing. And we know that actually there are some parts of the country which are well on with this journey. As well as Scotland and, and Wales, the DFT has already signed up to collaborative arrangements in the West Midlands, East Midlands, Rail for North, but to mention three. And so as we step into this role, we are already beginning to work with those regions and those locations on what does GBR mean for that? What might we do to preserve the work we've already done, but actually further leverage those opportunities? And of course, one of the items that has, um, that has really uh, held some of the industry headlines uh, is the location of the GBR HQ. Um, and we have got that down to a short list, uh, the government, and given that to the government. The government is now considering those, and we believe that the Secretary of State will be putting a further short list out for public uh, vote later in this year, and we hope to be announcing a winner for that in the summer. So as I've said, you'll hear more details through the day. Uh, we've also got the opportunity through questions to get into a few more of the areas that you want to get into. But what I've talked about are important building blocks of how we deliver better in the near term as well as the long term. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me and look forward to your questions. So it is the burning question whether the headquarters will be in Barrow in Furness or not. My lips are sealed. <laughs> um, thank you very much indeed. Like all rail conferences, like most great Western services, we're running slightly late. Um, every journalist needs a uh, sorry. Every journalist needs a handful of uh, key contacts to turn to for quiet advice. People we can trust uh, to help understand the implications of whatever the headlines are. Uh, people who can see beyond the confines of the sometimes quite insular bit here 
of the transport industry. And for me, Neil Robertson is one of the best at doing that. Neil's the chief executive of NSAR, the National Skills Academy for Rail. Uh, Neil is often provocative in what he says, uh, but he also, this is the bit I like, he always backs it up with good, hard evidence. So having picked you up, Neil. <coughs> Thank you, Paul. <coughs> Paul and I have got a number of things in common, but I, sh I, I want to share a secret about uh, what Paul's doing. Paul's taking in some Ukrainians. Well done. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. I'll, 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 I think I'm ready. No, no, I'll, I'll talk about it later in the day, because collecting them from St Pancras this weekend and getting some people who've never been in this country who have never travelled by train in this country, who have no idea where Pusey Station is, was quite an interesting experience. I'll talk about it this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I've got a few numbers for you. I know there's some lawyers in the room, so I'll, you know, you're, you're good at words, maybe less good with numbers, but you can talk to me afterwards about them. <laughs> uh, <coughs> thank you all for coming and for the invitation. I want to pick up on some of the economic questions that uh, Sir Peter raised. So I'm not going to talk about structure of the industry or ticketing. Uh, the, the, there are five sort of quick themes for us to reflect on. I'll say something about each of these at some speed because of time, and we can come back to them in questions or later. Uh, we have a number of things going on just now. Some could call it a perfect storm. We have the great investment, the IRP, 96 billion. I agree with Nigel on many things, but uh, I don't agree with Nigel on this. I think that's a fantastic outcome, right? And we've got to spend it properly, as Sir Peter said. But we've got the great rage in the Treasury. The Treasury hate us. They despise us. This is not good. In history, the Treasury normally wins. Read uh, Hilary Mantel if you don't believe me. We have the great exodus. Strangely, we left the EU and the Europeans went home and we've lost nearly 10% of our workforce. This is quite serious. We did it to ourselves. Who knew? Uh, we also have uh, the, great, the great discontent in the, the, in the uh, industrial relations side of things that Sir Peter mentioned. We have the great ageing. We are old. We are very old. F the number of people under 25 in the railway halved recently. We're getting older by the minute. And, and you didn't need me to tell you that, but on average we are, we are as well. And, of course, we had the great pandemic, and that, that meant that not a lot of training happened, not a lot of investment, not a lot of new stuff happened, or not as much as it should. A lot of, a lot of money was spent, a lot of good things happened, but not to take us forward. So, where do we find 1.5 billion? As Annette says, that's not down the back of the, the sofa. We've done lots of work on this as part of our GBR evidence uh, uh, submission. About 800 million of that is people. Half, just over half, is people in a range of things. And about 700 million of that is productivity. And the, the, so that's the big opportunity. Now, productivity is where you invest to save. Some bits of the industry are better at this than others. The, the, the train manufacturers are quite good at this. And the talks have actually got a reasonably good track record in this because of the investment in new trains. Infrastructure, less so. So there's, there's a lot of uh, opportunity. But let me say something about the people. The top two there, that adds up to 30. The top two there are about people. First of all, we've got to train the people we have better, and that will give us 6% reduction unit costs, whether that's management, deeper engineering or technical, digital or uh, rail systems. But more, even more so, we've got to bring in some new people because we have skill shortages. What do skill shortages lead to? Ask a lawyer. Wage inflation. We have got epic wage inflation. So here's where some of our opportunities lie. We've got 96 billion to spend, but we have only in the supply chain average investment on innovation only 1% of turnover. This is half other sectors. To quote Liz Truss, this is a disgrace and needs to be higher. And only 2% on apprenticeships, that needs to be higher as well. 
The talks are doing it through their contracts. There's something in procurement. It's about half what it needs to be. Both those numbers probably should double. There's a number of reasons for this. Uncertainty being the most commonly talked about one. You hear a lot about that, and there's a, there's a, there's a lot of truth in that, but it's not the whole answer. There's a culture that says, as suppliers, we don't need to invest, we'll just pass on the costs. Well, that's got to change, really has got to change. And that's one of the reasons the Treasury hates us, because we, uh, the, as the supply chain, do not perform as a proper market should. We have a culture of poaching, which pushes up wages, which is good for the people in the industry, it's bad for costs, and it's bad for bringing new people into the industry. That has to change. And we have to leverage procurement much more to change that culture. Here's the latest data on the skill shortages, just updated for you. This is the first time we've, we've published this. Uh, we, we are short, as you would expect. Nobody ever believes that we're short of quantity surveyors. Why do people hate quantity? Are there any quantity surveyors here? No? No, too, too busy working. Yeah, we're short of them. Everybody, we, we have years of engineering. We have women in engineering. We have en tomorrow's engineers. Nobody ever talks about quantity surveyors. What a shame. Anyway, we're short of them as well as, as, well as engineers. So below the line means we're short. So in 2026, we're short of 15,000 people. Okay, there's 250,000 people in the workforce. So do the maths. Yeah, that's a lot of people. That's why we've got wage inflation. So we really need to act on that now, or else we'll have no credibility with the Treasury, and we will never get the 1.5 billion. Absolutely no chance without doing that. Because uh, the, the Treasury get a chart from the, the, uh, from o, the ONS, and it shows our costs compared to all other sectors. We are an outlier at the wrong end, a, a, a distant outlier. Who's that? It's not, <laughs> it's not Ian Prosser, it's not Nigel Harris, that is Private Fraser. Now what did he say? We're all doomed. We're all doomed. Now are we all doomed? What do you think? 96 billion from, from investment, Nigel, 96 billion, that's good isn't it? Half of which has gone on HS2. Good, good, fantastic. I'm going to tell you why that's a good thing in a minute, okay? So we're not doomed, and of course we are good in the environment, but we cannot be complacent about that. If we wait for the environmental opportunity to come to us, the Treasury will have cut us. So there's lots we need to do to be ready for, for taking our proper place in the environmental question. And innovation. So there is a number of important innovations happening in the industry just now, and GBR will have to will have to create the environment to increase that, to foster more innovation, and to let the, the private sector do more. So one example of this is a project that we're doing the PMO for called Living Lab, where there's 26 different partners creating innovation. So we've got new foot bridges, we've got off-site manufacture, we've got whole life costing, we've got cooling on the tube, whole range of things. The important thing about that is not all the detail, well that's important for those of you in those communities, the important thing is how hard it is to innovate in rail, but it is possible. So we're not doomed because there's some clever people. We have to open up the, 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 the opportunities for more investment. And we've got to value it and take away the, the many, 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 many barriers to why you wouldn't want to invest in rail. So, but plenty good news and we're, we're, we're t sharing this separately. But, you know, off-site manufacture, brilliant. The new footbridge, half the carbon, half the time, 75% of the costs. That's not rocket science. That's, that's numbers that lawyers can understand as well as everybody else. So we, we should be doing more of that. And, uh, <coughs> and we can, with that, we can make the contribution towards the 700 million that Annette's got to find. Good luck, Annette. Now here's some more good news. And this is why HS2, even if you don't like HS2, and I happen to like it, but even if you don't like it, it is one of the best job creation schemes the, the country's got, okay? Rail jobs are good jobs. You know that, because that's why you're, you're all here. But we're probably about the third best of all jobs for social value. 
The government measures social value. I'm amazed and happy and impressed how much the government has stuck to the levelling up agenda. They are serious about it. I thought it would just go. I was being cynical. I was wrong. It's deadly serious and it's not going to go away. And, and uh, the ORR, not the ORR, RSSB uh, launched today the social value calculator to help people calculate it. But of all the things you calculate in social value, the most important is giving new jobs to disadvantaged people, especially in the North. New jobs, apprenticeships to disadvantaged people. This is the thing that we need to get good at or even better at, because we're actually quite good at it without trying, but we can be even better. And this is the great news for us, is that if we actually fill those jobs, we will smash our social value targets and the government will continue to invest in us. Because we are competing not with rail money, we're competing with submarines. Because a submarine gives you good social value. We've not proven it before, but we're able to prove it now. So there's some modelling. It's not, not in the public domain. It's, uh, it's the modelling for the, some of the IRP. Okay? So that look at those figures. 1.2 billion social value from the IRP investment. Okay? That is competitive. But we've got to deliver on that. We've got to convert that 96 billion into new jobs for people from disadvantaged backgrounds. And there's some great work happening on that just now. NHS2 and other places, GTR are very good at it. Lots of people are very good at it, but we are, it, it's, it's going to be a theme. So, smell the coffee. We need to invest more in our people and we need to modernise and invest in data analysis as well to help us understand it all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I, can I just do a brief and shameless plug? Uh, because last week, Neil and I had a conversation about some of that for the next issue of Rail Review magazine, which is, of course, the most thoughtful magazine in the rail industry. <laughs> Nigel, who... Oh, yes, edits it. Uh, Steph. <laughs> Are you done? Is that it? Okay, oh, no, thank you. No, Steph edits shameless it, really. Plug done. It says my name next to my managing editor, but Steph puts that together in her own right. Right. Um, let me just slightly correct a, 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 I'm sure, a mischievous remark from Paul earlier. Um, Sir Peter Hendy did not say a train line shouldn't exist. What he said was he'd have opposed its foundation at the formation of it. He also went on to say it is here, it does a good job and has got a place in the future. And to tell us about that, did you notice that segue there? <laughs> We've got John Davis, Vice President of Indi Relati Industri Industry Relations, can't get my mouth to work, unusual, um, for train line. John. Over to you. Thank you, Nigel. So, good morning all. Um, pleasure to be with you here today, and thank you to Sir Peter for his words of encouragement at the start. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about how we as an industry can make substantial change if we collectively put our minds to it and do this by reference to a very vivid and a very real case study and how we can transform the lives of our most regular customers, the commuters and season ticket holders, and how we need to think carefully about the industry approach to future fares, ticketing and retail strategy as well. So as we all know, industry taking roughly three quarters of the revenue that it did pre-COVID with leisure broadly fully recovered and commuter and season ticket revenue around half of that. And the question therefore becomes, what do we have to do to encourage those once inelastic commuter markets to return? And it seems, of course, inevitable that the traditional commute of four or five days a week has gone forever. But in order to put our best foot forward as an industry, we need to sell to these groups of consumers more effectively than we've ever done before. And when I think about the creation of GBR and of GBR as a retailer, I think most about the opportunity to work together to innovate and to create and to deliver the retail framework for the future. And I would like to share with you today some ways in which we can do that because there are things that we can do now that do not require legislation, will not take years, don't need a sizable investment in cash because the investment required has already been committed and that customers will love. And I want to talk about how when we collaborate as an industry, we can do great things and we know this because we've done them already. And it needs a mindset and a belief in collaboration a coalition of the willing, if you like. And it's not necessarily the easiest way to do things, but it invariably produces the best results. So I will talk about collaboration today and to do so by reference to a journey that the industry has already been on. 
Mobile ticketing is truly a success story of industry collaboration and it might well be a story that you don't know much about in detail because we often don't attach the same importance in the industry to the work that is done in retail to other areas of the industry because retailing isn't that glamorous compared to a cross rail or a, an electrification program or a shiny new train fleet. But under, over the last 10 years, a, a revolution in retail has quietly been underway. And of course, the enabler of this revolution was and is the smartphone. Uh, I think of the smartphone we all do as the dominant consumer trend of our age. We all run our lives from them now. In 2008, a quarter of the population had a smartphone. Now it's 92%. And in any consumer context, train travel included, if you are going to build retail propositions that customers want to use, then you need to use a technology that they are engaged in anyway. Otherwise, you build in obstacles to adoption from the start. And this is something that Transport for London taught us some years ago when they began the move from Oyster to EMV bank cards. Don't be arrogant and assume that I am content to change my money into your money because it suits you. Give me as a consumer something that works for me in the same format that I use to run the rest of my life. And customers do not expect and will not accept that they should have to work hard at these things. They demand excellence in their consumer experiences, and rightly so. And if we cannot find it within ourselves to deliver excellent consumer experiences, then we should not expect that, con that customers will jump to return simply because we wish that they would. So, mobile ticketing on national rail, I think, provides us with some useful guidance and some inspiration for the future. And it also provides lessons about how we can do things differently. Mobile ticketing as a mainstream thing on national rail is now 10 years old. So where do we find ourselves? And more centrally, what enabled the success that we now have on our hands? Well, the headline would be mobile ticketing is now available on every train operator on national rail or planned to be so in the next 12 months. Last year, Scott Rail joined the mobile ticketing revolution and next month, we will begin work with our colleagues at Southeastern and their retail partner, On Track Retail, on their mobile enablement. And we look forward to joining with Mersey Rail and C2C in due course. And we have seen as we emerge from the pandemic a structural shift towards mobile retailing as consumers move electively towards self-service. So what enabled this to happen? Let me share my first slide if I can. So on the slide you can see some of the incremental steps that took Trainline and the industry on its barcode journey between approximately 2011 now. It is not a complete chronology. There will be bits that people were involved in that are missing. But starting with cross-country's first step into advanced purchase tickets on a mobile device in 2011 via a series of trials and incremental steps in different parts of the country, different train operators, other independent retailers, and the industry collaboration to develop the e-ticket format that we have today. The RDG barcode programme to fund Gateline barcode enablement has been a huge success and with much greater sales of mobile tickets than originally forecast, was going to pay off its original CapEx investment early. But now, we're delighted that a new Phase 7 of the barcode programme has been recently agreed by RDG, DFT and retailers, and this will ultimately see every gate aisle on the National Rail Network barcode enabled within approximately 12 months. Now, as an, as an aside, I'm obviously going to note in passing that around three quarters of that programme funding uh, 19 million so far and about 16 million to come has been contributed by independent retailers via the fees that they pay when they issue mobile tickets. And this is private sector investment in the industry in action, which of course is music to Treasury's ears. And the private sector is investing because we want the industry to succeed. And because it is essential, we give customers the technology that they want as soon as possible. So what have we achieved? Let's have a look at this chart. As an industry, these two charts demonstrate how, quietly and perhaps unnoticed, mobile barcode tickets have now overtaken Magstripe. Over 43% of national rail revenue is now fulfilled as a mobile barcode ticket. And at an industry level, in period 13 just gone, the revenue was made up of a fulfillment type, as you can see on the right. Look at the change in four years from 2.3% to 43% now fulfilled as mobile. This is what happens when you give customers what it is that they want. Now, for Trainline as a retailer, the switch to mobile has been rapid to say the least. And let's have a look at this slide. 
In 2017, approximately a quarter of what train lines sold was delivered as a mobile ticket, and the rest was almost exclusively collected from ticket vending machines at stations. Now, 92% of what train line sells is eligible for fulfilment as a mobile ticket. Where we offer mobile to customers, 99% of people take it. And these two numbers in tandem mean that just over 90% of everything that train line sells goes out of the door as a barcode ticket. So let's just pause there. In 2017, it was 25%. And in 2022, it is now over 90%. And it also turns out that when you sell a mobile ticket, something rather wondrous happens because you help customers save time booking their ticket and sometimes tongue in cheek. We liken the typically 10 minutes that a consumer saves by not having to collect their ticket from a machine to a generalized journey time saving. And imagine how many hundreds of millions of pounds you need to invest in infrastructure to achieve something similar. And you can also find new ways to serve customers. If their plans change, they can change their purchase more easily, exactly as they would be able to do if they were buying anything else digitally. You can enrich their experience by offering relevant content in the moment that helps them feel that they're in control of and getting value from the booking and traveling process. Split ticketing, digital rail cards, delay repay, or talk to them in real time about how their journey might be affected by delays or cancellations. And it turns out that if you make it easier for people to browse and to choose and to buy and to travel, they do more of it. Who knew? <laughs> Customers buying mobile on train line go on to buy two to three more times frequently than they did before. And we have achieved a great deal as an industry here. And there is a clear direction of travel. But before we get too self-congratulatory, what could we have done differently or, or better? Well, the first answer has to be speed. It has taken 10 years to get to the place we are today and the job is not yet done and that is frankly a glacial state of change and we need to do better. The remaining half of the gated estate will be barcoded in the next 12 months and from there we can all build but this has taken too long. And when I think about the creation of GBR, I'm hopeful that we can harness the very best of the industry success story that's mobile ticketing to continue to develop the retail revolution collaboratively and in partnership because we know how to do this. We have done this before but we can do it more quickly and we can deliver the benefits faster. And the second answer to what could we have done better is, in my view, we've left behind an, a really important group of customers that we started with. Our most regular customers, the commuter, the season ticket holder, that constituency of our customers we now need to turn our attention to the most. So how do we drive the commuter return via mobile ticketing? Well, let's rinse and repeat, right? Again, the rail industry needs to work collaboratively to meet the challenge of digitizing season tickets to deliver a richer, higher quality ticketing experience for commuters and regular travelers and help them be encouraged to return to rail. And from a retailing perspective, we've underserved this group of customers for way too long. They buy our most expensive products, but their retail experience does not really match that truth. And a majority of our season ticket holders, two thirds, are still using paper tickets. And it cannot be right that customers have to stand in line and be relieved of several hundred or even several thousand pounds for the privilege. Now, although good progress has been made by some train operators offering a smart card, a smart card still requires the customer to carry the industry's own branded card around with them when they travel. Obtaining a card is a barrier to travel in its own right. And in an era when we're increasingly focusing on sustainability, the use of a plastic card is, is somewhat counterintuitive. And so to be truly transformational, we need to take the action now to remove those kind of barriers and deliver something that's mobile enabled. And at Trainline, we love this kind of problem. Our reputation is built on targeting issues that technology can solve and simplify and make seamless for passengers. And we have a team of 400 data scientists and developers and software engineers all solely focused on improving customer experience. And from ticket alerts to split save to carbon calculators, we've got a great track record of delivering digital products which attract more customers to rail and encourage them to make more journeys. And we now have a new product that can finally crack that tough nut of providing barcode season tickets for commuters, and we call this the S-Ticket. And S-Ticket is the new digital barcode season ticket standard for the industry. And we've developed it in conjunction with Rail Delivery Group, and we've proven it in a pilot with GTR, and it's now ready to be extended to the whole industry. It's a solution that is available immediately and addresses many of the problems that I've been highlighting. 
For customers, an S-Ticket offers an easy and immediate way to buy a season ticket and deliver it to their phone. It can be fulfilled immediately before travel. It doesn't need a queue to collect it. There's no need to carry a separate physical card. And from the train operator perspective, revenue protection is simplified, fraud is prevented, and there is huge potential to understand these customers and how the season ticket holders are using the product. But developed as an industry standard, the S-Ticket has been successfully trialled with GTR in recent months. The technology and the customer proposition have been proven, and S-Ticket is ready for rollout across the network right now. And we will be retailing S-Ticket through the app and website, but this is not a train line only product. We've collaborated closely with RDG, and together we want to encourage all train operators to accept season tickets issued to S-Ticket across the network. But we also want to support train operators to offer S-Ticket through their own platforms, and we'll do this in two ways. Firstly, we supply retail technology to a number of white-label train operating company partners in the UK, and S-Ticket can be enabled on their platforms immediately, free of charge, and we'll be working with them to extend that benefit to as many more passengers as we can as soon as possible. Secondly, we will also provide technical assistance for other retailers and TIS providers to help them build and launch S-Ticket solutions on their own platforms. Fundamentally, Trainline wants to work in partnership with the industry to ensure that S-Ticket is a success because it is in our collective interests that we break down the barriers to commuters and regular travellers returning. So to conclude, and as we think about the future fares, ticketing and retailing programme being developed by GBR Transition Team, I would like to leave you with some things to think about. As has been referred to already, development of pay-as-you-go will be a prominent theme, and understandably so. There is no doubt that a simple tap-and-go proposition in the right context is an unbeatable uh, customer experience. As pay-as-you-go is developed across wider parts of the network, let's ensure that we do it, however, in a way that we know best, by collaborating across the industry, by developing solutions that work effectively in the interests of customers, and by building on the successes of the past. Now, TFL truly led the way with pay-as-you-go, of course, and London has a world-class proposition, but London has also become an island. If you want to travel from a national rail origin to a national rail destination across London, or to or from a Zone 1 or 2 destination from outside London, you now have to acquire the travel entitlements to do so separately in different transactions and using different media. And at an industry level, we risk losing something here. The orange magstripe ticket may not have had much to commend it in a digital age, but it was and is a universal token, allowing travel to be booked and taken across the network and including London. But as pay as you go expands, what about journeys that are part island and part bridge? How will they be served in a single transaction? There was a time when legislation was created to protect what was referred to back then as network benefits, the idea that it would be necessary to protect a nationally available and interoperable fare structure and a single token would support it. Network benefits could be framed today as mobility as a service within the rail industry, the idea you can plan and book one journey in a single transaction across multiple modes or transit providers. And as an industry, we had this, but we're letting it slip away and seemingly without question. National rail journeys are more complicated than zone one or two journeys on TFL. They need customers to understand train times and platforms and prices and to know when peak and off peak is and to be able to continue to use rail cars and other concessions and have reservations to choose class of travel. And in some contexts, we condition customers to buy in advance to save and in other contexts, we promote tap and go for the best fare and this is all a bit confusing and contradictory. And there is no reason why all of these things, network benefits, a universal token, multimodality, cannot continue to be true. Contactless EMV can be used for prepaid as well as pay-as-you-go journeys. And delivering all of this inside an app environment could bring the best of both worlds and allow customers to choose the extent to which they want to tap and go or plan in advance. Allow the customer to choose. The banking industry offers a directional and analogous view. First contactless transactions in the UK in 2007, but last year, a quarter of those transactions were made by in-app virtual EMV cards. So why would you use a banking app when you could otherwise just tap and go in your local coffee shop? Well, the answer is people want to know what they are spending. They want to track their expenditure by type. They want to make different types of transaction using one simple interface. And the same is surely true of rail travel. And when Keith Williams addressed the industry, Rail Industry Association last week, he said, 
The public very clearly told us they want rail to function as one interoperable network right across the country. And I think he's right. So we should, be, we should be developing the retail proposition of the future, one where customers can continue to make seamless journeys across the network easily and with certainty they have the best fare regardless of how they travel and not merely assume that there is a read across from that which was developed 15 years ago for a very specific set of use cases. There's a vast amount in GBR's in-tray, as we'll continue to hear today. But by heeding the lessons of the past, and by harnessing the power of all industry players working in collaboration, we can make huge strides in the area of digital ticketing. And thanks to S-Ticket, we have the opportunity to transform the customer experience, perhaps even before there is royal assent on the bill that will create GBR. Thank you. And thank you for, uh, for going at a good clip there. We appreciate it like a, any good railwayman seeking to make up a bit of time where possible. Right. Um, I can't continue, obviously, without taking issue with Neil about a couple of things. I have never criticised the IRP for the 96 billion, not ever. And half of that is on HS2, so we haven't got 96 billion to spend. My criticism has been about the dishonest claims for it like taking 20 minutes out of King's Cross Leeds times, which people who tell me they know, they know what they're talking about say isn't possible. Like doing Leeds to Bradford in 10 minutes, which is 12 miles and two stops, without warp drive and the sort of acceleration the human body cannot stand, that's not going to happen either. So, got to get that off my chest. Right, just one or two tweets that I picked up during the uh, thing. Mick Whelan has left. Hope you both, that's you and me, Paul. Have a great day, but politically we are going into a long period of managed decline, says Aslef. Um, Rail Picture Library, I think he's here somewhere. So he's noticed a significant yeah. shift in uh, type of rail passengers, but needs to adapt. Rail needs to adapt to a risk missing a major opportunity, which is the essence of your comments, John. Um, and completely non-rail, we just <laughs> chuck it in for the sake of it. 4th of May 1982, second Vulcan attack on Port Stanley and the day the Sheffield was sunk. 40 years, where did that go? Right, it's been announced while that session was on that Crossrail's going to open on May 24th, running Monday to Saturday initially, but there you go. Right, let us start with the questions. Paul, you tell me, I haven't seen it, but you tell me you've got a bit of a stonker online, so let's kick off with that. So the way this is going to work is Nigel will pick up questions in the room and I will pick up some questions online. And the first one is from George Davis. Thank you very much indeed, George. I'm, as always, he says, Neil is on the money with his analysis. What is his advice for GBR to ensure the plan for rail is not just looking at financial capital, but social capital too? So if I can ask Neil first and then Annette Short to answers, respond. please, so we can get as much in as possible. Short answer. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, George. George is good. He knows what he's talking about. He used to be at Heathrow. Uh, measure it. That's the easiest thing. Just measure it. Bosses in this room, and there's a few, measure it. It's easy to measure. There's tools to help you. It will count. And then set targets. 10% of your new starts should be from disadvantaged backgrounds minimum. Stretch target 20. We wrote that into the HS2 social value numbers. I thought I was being a bit bold. Actually, I think HS2 anecdotally are beating that. And 20% will be the next target. One in five new starts should come from a disadvantaged background. Okay, just think about that. It's not that difficult. It's not a big ask. And we smash levelling up. Thank you. Alex. So uh, just the only build on that, and I agree, measure it, target, and it will come. Uh, government is interested in it, and therefore we, we, you're pushing an, uh, an open door. Uh, but it's not a choice of or. You've got to deliver both the financial capital and the social capital. We'll never get away with saying put the financial capital to one side. So it's, we've got to do both. Now, you have a personal interest in this. We, we've spoken about yes. this before, in, in pushing people who would not normally come into the railway who would not choose this as a career sure. so there is by your own admission a lot of work to indeed. do here. indeed indeed and, and, and you're talking about diversity and inclusion from people from all kinds of backgrounds in the interview you and I uh, covered um, so so it's true so I didn't enter the industry knowing I was going to be here because uh, it wasn't something that I grew up interested in um, but somehow I'm, somehow I'm still here uh, nearly 20 years later um, so 
to a small acorn, and it is just a small acorn, it, the, the way we are starting our recruitment in GBRTT means that we have begun to see a difference. Our recruitment has delivered a 50% um, female to male ratio of offers made to people, 25% from ethnic minorities, 8% of people declaring a disability uh, in, in the office. So in line with what Neil says, if you try, you can actually achieve that. Um, and we're talking about what we might do in GBRTT in terms of apprenticeships and, and young persons. Thank you. Nigel. John, have got anything? You've got anything to say on that? Okay. Questions. Anthony, you were catching the chairman's eye and I was going to come to you anyway. We have got microphones. Can you please say who you are and what your affiliation is so that people watching later on and people in the room who might not know you, Anthony. I've never been asked my affiliation before. Um, <laughs> you can't touch your forehead, is Eric Morgan would have said. <laughs> Expectation. You have to do you are. Sorry? You have to do you are. Yeah. Um, Anthony Smith, Transport Focus. Sorry. Expectation. After one year and after five years, what difference will I notice after GBR has been set up? Because Sir Peter was very good about the public money. There's a lot of consumer money going into this industry. Thank you. Uh, and Who I guess wants to start? I mean, yeah. Maybe I start. Um, so I think, I think after one year, the difference will be that passengers and freight users telling us that they can begin to see we're interested in them in a way that we weren't interested in before. That's got to be our first and primary uh, uh, target. And the other big target is Treasury beginning to change its mind about how, uh, how, uh, how familiar that or how confident they are. Uh, Neil was dead right. The most, most difficult conversations we have right now are with Treasury, not because they're terrible people, but they come at it from, from a perspective that we're not able to satisfy. As we move further into the future, it's how we really can show we are taking uh, decisions across the system as a whole in the interests of those passengers and, that, uh, and, the, and the cost of the industry in a way that just isn't, isn't possible today and I think those are the two two kind of big barometers for whether we succeed or not. Paul did you? Another want? online question here this is a good one um, this is for, for both of you if I may uh, is an equivalent of Austria's Klima ticket ah. with its revolutionary impact on modal choice simply beyond us be Anthony or it, huh? is it a goal for GBR? So I, I have to admit I'm not familiar with the Austria Klima ticket, um, uh, so I'm going to talk at it from, from that perspective. Um, so I think there are, in, 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 in stages, uh, there's some, some rot we've got to fix, firstly within what we've got today, and, and you, know, you talked very pers persuasively about that. Also how we can perhaps... Uh, move forward in technology without having to go through all the stages that others have had to go through because technology has moved beyond uh, some of that. Multimodal is, as I said, a really strong feature of what particularly local authorities have talked about in terms of our uh, call for evidence. Uh, Manchester, for example, is very interested in how they can look at multimodal across their tram, their bus and their local rail network. Um, and so... Uh, whether we like it or not, that pull from passengers, from local authorities is there, so we've got to walk towards it as well. John, John with regard to the Klima tickets before you start, mm. um, the train operators have traditionally not liked Rover tickets or of any kind and have refused to even market the old line Rover, so if you could work that sort of thing <laughs> into your answer. Yeah, OK. Um, so the Klima ticket is, is, is a one-off purchase that guarantees you indefinite travel across the Austrian network. Um, over, over a period of time and, and I think that we are we're into an era where we just need to do whatever we can to encourage people to leave their cars behind and embrace travelling by train so that we get some real modal shift going on and it seems as we come out of the pandemic that road usage has recovered completely and, and rapidly bounced back and the same is not true of rail travel and I think to take the question in its broadest context we have to find a way of developing new and imaginative products and ideas that people respond to and experimenting with things and not being frightened to fail and maybe trialling a few things in different areas and learning from them. We can learn very fast in the digital era, turn them on, try them, turn them off again if they don't work or if they do work, try and some more. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw a hand there trying to catch the chairman's eye. A lawyer. <laughs> yes. That's a lawyer, I'm afraid. Uh, Ian Tucker from Burgess Salmon. 
Um, we've heard a number of uh, interesting initiatives. We've seen a number of in interesting initiatives recently to bring passengers back to rail. We're quite interested in people's views as to whether the future of effective initiatives to bring passengers back is more likely to be central, like 50% off tickets across the network, or driven more historically by local networks and local operators. Who's going to tell? So, um, so some views. I, I don't think we necessarily have to make that choice. I think we've, we've got to look at both. I really support this view of, actually, you can try things and they work or not. And we're beginning to have a, uh, some inroads in that conversation with Treasury that says, one, that's always been a good idea, but two, because we understand much less today how passengers will behave because the rules are changing, we have to try that. But I, yeah, there is a strong pull from local authorities, as I've said, and local um, region, cities, placemakers on how we can also look at local uh, positions. The point of GBR being decentralised is to encourage that, as well as recognising that it is also a network as well, and how we preserve the two. We've, we've, got, to th we've got to do both. But I don't think we can afford to cho choose between the two. John, you any comments on that? I think that there's a balance to strike between centralisation giving consistency and control and complete de decentralisation giving chaos and anarchy. And, and in the middle ground, there's something that, that, that must be a sweet spot somewhere. And, and, and I wonder whether, you know, helping the Treasury, helping Treasury be encouraged to think more boldly that if you do things that customers want to, to buy, um, that you can sell more of them and, 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 and experiment with relatively little risk and prove the revenue benefit effects yeah. and, and then move on quite quickly from that. I mean, the two of you make a really important point about doing stuff and trying it because we've got to move the needle, haven't yeah. we? Because the most powerful statement we've heard this morning was from Neil and it wasn't about what Neil said about me or Ian Prosser. I've never heard Ian say, we're all doomed. I think he might have thought of it at the time or two. <laughs> but the most powerful comment was the Treasury haters. <laughs> You actually said that, the Treasury haters. Well, they're going to need to see the needle move to take us yeah. seriously, aren't they? Lady at the back had her hand up. Hi, I'm Josie Drath, uh, working in Rail at Arup. Um, I've got a question, actually it leads on nicely from Treasury haters, um, <laughs> and maybe a precursor to the next talk. Um, investment in rail. I think a lot of what we're talking about this morning, and particularly in, in Amit's talk, was about... Um, you know, improvements, so accessibility, the whole industry strategic plan, ticket reform, um, but it sounds like it might take more money. So are we asking Treasury for more money to achieve this or are we reprioritizing? Um, and if so, how? And how do we convince Treasury to, to spend more? Who wants to start? Neil. The private sector should be doing most of the investment in rail beyond the 96 billion. It's perfectly possible for this to happen. The offshore wind industry, if anybody knows anything about that, is the best example. We've built a world-class industry in about t quicker than in the timeline on John's graph. We've built a world-class industry with private money, with some sensible public sector contracting and regulation. It should absolutely be private. There's lots of private companies would like to invest more, but can't quite find the mechanism for it. So it's not about going back to the Treasury. We need to go to the Treasury less often, go to the private sector more often. And, and I think one of the things, um, Neil, that, that we've <coughs> got to think hard about is how do we create that environment that, that allows that to do that. And, and actually in the last uh, month or so, um, a combination of uh, DFT and some of the work we're doing is actually thinking quite hard about what are those structures? What is, what is it? Uh, and actually, quite a big element of this is the cultural, cultural approach of um, those of us who, who've come from Network Rail and other kind of public organisations. Our cultural, uh, dare I say, allergic reaction to private sector and how we overcome that is a, is a big part of it. But also, as we bring the industry together, as those fragments change, what new opportunities come because it's just been too difficult to deal with all those different organisations? Yeah. The preconditions are really important. Um, and it's about providing a context in which private sector can invest and it can invest for the long term because the long term is what it takes. It requires the ability to invest and make a reasonable rate of return. 
um, and it requires an ability to invest in a spirit of partnership and, and, and collaboration. And, 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 and stability. I think can, and stability, exactly right. Okay. Um, one last one, and then we'll break for coffee. Oh, we'll squeeze. I'll tell you what, give them us both at once. Johnny, you had your hand up. Um, so if you give it to Johnny, then give the microphone to this gentleman straight away, and let's take them both at once, and you lads can mix and match among them. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Nigel. My name's Johnny Shute. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Rail Safety and Standards Board. And this one's for Annette, if I could. Um, GBR won't represent all of the rail industry. Um, there are numbers who will sit outside of it, supply chain, railing stock companies, uh, freight. Mm -hmm. How is it that you can ensure that we maintain collaboration going forward such that GBR maintains itself as a guiding mind rather than a controlling mind? Ooh, subtle distinction. If you pass the microphone to this gentleman here. Yeah, no, fabulous question. Um, hang on, just hang on, just one sec, we'll take this one Okay, as well. sorry, Nigel. Okay, we get both as one, you mix and match among them then, and we get more in. Okay, Go. thanks. Uh, Richard Brown from West Coast Partnership of Anti-West Coast and the Shadow Operator for HS2. Um, as an operator, the, the most common thing we get from customers is always about service performance. Just trains working as they should. Um, you've talked a lot about a lot of things today which are all very valuable and important, but that's the basics, that's what gets people back more case treasury off our back um, so in that bit about track and train and your work with GBR and the impediments like you said I, you know, it's no secret that collaboration hasn't worked well across the industry with Network Rail particularly um, although obviously we all worked as much Indeed. collaboratively together as Indeed. we can um, you know you, you talked about regional Sorry, managing, can we have the yeah, regional managers and, and uh, public sector contracts and all, uh, passenger service contracts uh, could you talk a bit more about that and about um, how you see that collaboration working on the track and train in the future? Okay, inclusivity with GBR and track and train. Work. Yeah. Dive uh, in as you want, Charles. So, so fundamentally, I think around both of those questions is, um, is recognising that actually what are we all here to, to deliver collectively for, for those industries? So whether you're in the private sector, public sector, whether you're in some of those functions that sit outside of GBR or in those functions, we've all got to be really clear that we are here to get people travelling on the railways to deliver the service they need and have those uh, uh, aligned objectives. One of the things Keith talked about quite persuasively was that the industry isn't just full of bad people deliberately going out of their way not to work together. <laughs> the industry is full of people working hard towards the incentives that they have within their different fragments. But those incentives don't add up. They don't deliver a c clear collective outcome for whether it's the passengers or the cost of the industry. And that's how, as a guiding mind, I believe GBR is going to have to operate, is creating that common, common sets of incentives and helping those organisations and working with those organisations that are outside its direct purview in re response to your question, Johnny, but also in your response around collaboration. It's how those contracts are set up to deliver it. And I think there's also then something about agility, because one of the other things that has happened in the, in the last 30 years, increasingly so over that time, is we've become uh, less and less agile as we've pushed towards working towards those contracts. Massive question, and I've only just scratched the surface of it. Well scratched. Um, Neil, do you want to scratch a bit more? Gouge it, please. Uh, no, no, building on what Annette says, and linking it to Anthony's earlier question, one P&L. Yeah. We've one P&L, not Singleton. many, I mean, the risk of sounding like an accountant, uh, one P&L is exciting, and that would be my test of GBR in five years' time. To what extent is one P&L working? One P&L should be giving us £200 million a year steady-state steady savings without even trying. Yeah, well, maybe trying a little bit, but that's easy, right? Because there are so many reasons. <laughs> sharing of data, sharing of data just being one. There's, there, there are schedule four, schedule eight, the list is endless of the reasons why the, the current system doesn't, I mean, it's amazing that there's any collaboration at all, frankly, in, in the current environment. So, I mean, I, and it, I mean, if you don't do something on that, really, no, you're right. you'll, you'll be, but anyway, you will, I know you will, and it's, it's going to be exciting. 
Yeah, single P&L is a key headline item. But who understands it? Who's the good thinkers on this? Because I don't think, I don't hear, maybe, the, I mean, this is for, in the development, but we, this is one of the things I urge you to, to, to talk to us about and have people who can really say some clear, pithy things to deal with Richard's question. Because we, we need leadership on one P&L because it's new for the industry in recent history, nice. unless, you're, unless you're quite old, <laughs> you can't remember one p &L. You're doing it again. <laughs> in the early part of the 12th century, when I started on it. Anybody else got stuff to add to that? Did we tackle both questions there? Did you both get some kind of an answer on, on something? Okay, well, look, let's wrap it up there for, 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 for coffee. If you didn't get your question in, bear it in mind, and I'm sure you can slot it through whatever framework we're talking about later on. There's going to be plenty of opportunity. Um, meanwhile, thanks ever so much for uh, some great questions this morning. Indeed. Um, most of all, thanks to Sir Peter Hendy, CBE, Anit Chandarana, Neil, I think, um, and, <laughs> and John Davies. So, appreciation in the usual way. Back here at 11 after your caffeine reviver. Oh, good. Good. Thank you.